Rome was engaged in a near constant stream of wars throughout its history. Many of these have been studied in detail by historians and feature prominently in the public mind. The Punic Wars, the Gallic Wars, the Civil Wars, the Parthian Wars, and more. However, a number of conflicts have been lost in the shadow of Rome's blockbuster clashes. One of these forgotten wars is the Great Illyrian Revolt, also known as the Bato Uprising, or the Pannonian Dalmatian War. Its importance should not be underestimated. After all, the war's outbreak caused panic in the streets of Rome, involved nearly one million rebels, and saw more legions deployed than any other battlefront since the Civil Wars, and most importantly, contained the blueprint for the ambush at the Teutoburg Forest. Today, let us take a look at this forgotten war. If you'd like to lead your own ancient army, you can do so with our sponsor, Conqueror's Blade. It's a free-to-play PC game with tactical MMO action set in a vast, open medieval world. Here players customize their own powerful warlords with unique weapon classes and special abilities to then command armies of over 80 diverse units in order to forge an empire. Fight epic PvP siege battles between teams of 15 players where attackers unleash devastating siege equipment like rams, towers, and artillery, while defenders respond in kind with their own cunning countermeasures. The gameplay stays fresh with themed seasons that offer new cosmetics, units, and rewards. The latest Season 6 Scourge of Winter, for instance, pits you against a powerful horde descending from the north. With new US servers going live, now is a great time to jump in and take advantage of many awesome promotions. Support the channel and play the game today by clicking the link in the description below to unlock a free week of premium access which grants you a 30% boost to earned hero and unit XP, bronze coins, and honor. Brave the freezing darkness and conquer. The war itself had deep roots, but relatively quiet beginnings. The Illyrians were a people who lived and thrived on piracy, especially through the Adriatic Sea between Rome and Greece. They had been somewhat pacified by the Romans, but the civil wars of the late Republic and the general instability of the time period triggered a return to mass piracy and banditry in the region. The problem took decades to resolve and involved some of the most famous names of the early Roman Empire including Agrippa, Tiberius, and Augustus. Most of the unrest was caused by separate tribes, none of which were particularly fond of Rome. Until the Bato Uprising though, none of them had worked together. In 6 AD, the simmering powder keg was finally ready to explode when these separate tribal forces would unite. During the last Illyrian uprising, the general Tiberius is said to have defeated and pacified the tribes of the region. In the aftermath, he gathered all of the adolescents, thousands and thousands of teenage boys and girls, and had them all sold into slavery to serve as an example to their families. About 15 years later, he was in Germania preparing an immense number of legions to execute a decisive assault against one of the last remaining Germanic tribes, the Marcomanni. During this period, the Romans pulled manpower from the legions in Eastern Europe, including the five Illyrian legions, and engaged in a mass recruitment campaign that may have resembled something closer to press ganging. If a region did not supply enough men, the men would instead be chosen by their Roman overlords. The Illyrians already having experienced their families torn apart were furious. The children who had watched their older siblings be taken away as slaves were now young adults, and the revolt erupted on the back of their fury. Roman sources indicate that the rebellion encompassed dozens of tribes which together numbered close to a million people in revolt. They were led by two major figures, both named Bato, hence the Bato Uprising, and were reportedly able to field over 200,000 infantry and 9,000 cavalry, the equivalent of roughly 40 legions. To make matters worse, Many of these forces had served as auxiliaries in Rome's armies and were intimately familiar with their tactics. The first move of the rebellion was to take the offensive. This involved carrying out a purge of all Romans within their lands. Soldiers and non-combatants were massacred across Illyria in a violent wave of bloodshed. This included a settlement of veterans which was killed to the man, as well as the remaining skeleton crew of Roman garrisons strung out across the territory. But the offensive did not stop there. The rebels next launched an assault on neighboring Macedonia, ravaging the landscape and continuing their butchery of Romans to the point that the province was considered to be occupied enemy territory. All of this must have been incredibly shocking. An entire province plunged into chaos, refugees clogging the streets, ports swarmed with desperate crowds, overflowing ships streaming across the Adriatic, and meanwhile, local authorities were scrambling to throw anything in the path of the rebels, but to no avail. They were only getting stronger. When news of the revolt reached Rome, the city and Augustus panicked. The Illyrians were on the doorstep of Italy, a mere week or two from the capital, with the main Roman army months away. Not since the revolt of Spartacus had such an enemy blade been so close to the throat of Italy. Augustus took immediate action. 
Outposts were set up on the road to Italy to keep tabs on the enemy and delay their advance. The Emperor also announced a general levy to conscript thousands into service, with the wealthy being required to supply a body of freedmen proportional to their income. At the same time, all retired veterans were called back to the line of duty. When some of these elites refused to comply or attempted to dodge the draft claiming some pre-existing condition, Augustus reportedly had their thumbs cut off. He was deadly serious. It was all hands on deck. Meanwhile, messengers raced to the legions at the corners of the Empire in a desperate plea for help. As the days dragged on, Augustus must have spent sleepless nights imagining the devastation should the Illyrians march on Italy and bring their purge to Rome itself. Finally though, the messengers reached the distant Roman army commanders. One by one, they too began to mobilize for the fight. The governor of Moesia, among the closest to the uprising, made ready with his three legions, while his eastern peer, the governor of Asia, also rallied forces. To the north, Tiberius finally got word and made ready to answer the call. The commander negotiated a hurried truce with the Germanic tribe that he had spent all season preparing to destroy and force marched his men south. Among his enormous army was a particularly talented cavalry commander named Arminius, who would learn much from the events ahead. The first Roman general on the scene was the governor of Moesia, a man named Aulus Caecina Severus. He was well acquainted with the hardships of war, having taken up a post which served as the first line of defense against some of the most persistent threats from across the Danube. Now would be another chance to act as Rome's shield. When a major contingent of Illyrians marched on the city of Sirmium, Severus moved to intercept. The two clashed near the river Drava in a bloody fight. We have no details of the encounter other than that it was a hard-fought event. Severus took a heavy beating but emerged on top. Following this Pyrrhic victory, he fell back to regroup and reinforce his men. Once the legions had licked their wounds and regained some semblance of fighting shape, they were sent back to the front. This time, however, Severus chose to advance his five depleted legions from the south. It seems that he was attempting to coordinate his attack with Tiberius's advance from the north to catch the rebels in a massive crushing pincer. Unfortunately, the maneuver did not go off without a hitch. Before Tiberius had even entered the province, Severus was again engaged by a larger Illyrian force. The auxiliaries were quickly routed, leaving the legions to fend for themselves. Surrounded and cut off, they faced complete annihilation. However, these cornered animals would not go down without a fight. The beleaguered legions fought like demons, standing firm against the storm. In the end, Severus emerged victorious once more, but the butcher's bill was high. He now chose to limp back to Moesia, which was itself being ravaged by Dacians and Sarmatians during his absence. There, he would stay for the remainder of the year. Meanwhile, the war raged across Illyria as the rebels moved to snuff out Roman resistance and draw yet more tribes to their cause. Hearing this, Tiberius rushed south to catch up with the advanced detachments of his army. However, upon reaching the front, his forces slowed to a crawl. The general was a careful man. He knew very well that the rebellion was running a large-scale guerrilla campaign and that any bullheaded charge into the fray would tear him to pieces. Thus, he turned to his area of expertise, the drawn-out game of logistical warfare. Rather than crushing the rebellion in a spectacular display of bravado, he would slowly strangle it to death. The seasoned commander set to work. He methodically pressed his way into Illyria, stopping to ensure that his supply lines to the rear were secure, while scorching the earth ahead to deprive the enemy of any useful material. It was a brutal, cruel way to fight a war, especially with winter fast approaching, but it was callously brilliant. In this way, Tiberius would minimize Roman losses while repeatedly kicking the enemy in the stomach. How long would the rebel leaders be able to keep up the fight when their children and wives fell to starvation? But the Illyrians were hardy folk. They pulled back to the natural defenses of the land and hunkered down to survive the hardest winter of their lives. This gave the rebel leaders some time to think. They were desperate for a win, any opportunity really, to strike back at Rome and push off the boot of Tiberius for even a moment. They would find their opportunity in the Vulcan marshes. Meanwhile, in the headquarters of Moesia, Severus also contemplated his next steps after having repelled the Dacians and Sarmatians. His men had been able to recover some of their composure. They were rested, healed, and now reinforced by new recruits. While his force was nowhere near its full fighting capacity, they were nonetheless an effective group of seasoned veterans ready for another go. The blazing rebellion in Illyria could not wait any longer. A fact made absolutely clear by a panicked Augustus who was dispatching more troops to flood the region. Thus, Severus began marching west once more, with his three heavily battered legions along with two more that had joined him from Asia Minor. His objective? To crack the eastern strongholds of the rebellion. As a first target, he chose the fortified town of Kibali. 
It was nestled near the junction of the Ulka and Danube rivers, atop the only major hill in the region. Flanking the position was near impossible due to the vast swampy marshland, and there was only a single road in or out. Such conditions made it difficult to take by force. Severus therefore resolved to take it by siege. All he had to do was camp his forces on the road, and the fortress would be cut off. However, Severus was wary of these marshes, and for good reason. The two Batos seemed to have enjoyed using him as a punching bag, rather than the more slow-moving Tiberius. Twice already, they had nearly crushed his legions, and were sure to be watching his every move for an opportunity to finish the job. He therefore quickly moved into position, and set about establishing a fortified camp at the bottleneck of the Vulcan marshes. Scouts reported that there were enemies in the area, but no major force had been sighted. Yet the marshes held a nasty surprise. The Illyrians had anticipated such a move by the Romans and had been amassing in the reeds. When night fell, they signaled the attack. The speed, intensity, and size of the assault caught Severus completely off guard. Romans still working outside the walls were quickly overwhelmed. Those who were not killed fled for the safety of the camp. Luckily in this department, Severus had been prepared with a textbook defense. Standard procedure dictated that Roman armies were to build massive pop-up fortresses every night while on campaign. They were laid out according to a designated plan and surrounded by a five-foot ditch, the soil of which was used to build up a wall that would be topped by pointed stakes. This one in particular must have been quite impressive as it hosted five legions with tens of thousands of soldiers and their support staff inside. As the rebel wave crashed upon the fortress, they were met by staunch resistance. Though heavily outnumbered, the Romans fought ferociously, knowing that there would be no escape. The Illyrians too were desperate for a win, as they battled not just to rescue Sibylli, but the hopes of the rebellion. For hours, the two sides clashed in wave after wave of assault. Luckily for the Romans, they had situated their camp on the best land in the area, which afforded them an entrenched high ground position from which to coordinate a disciplined defense. The Illyrians, meanwhile, were deprived of the ground to properly stage their assaults and had to claw their way uphill through marshy terrain to get at their foes. This imbalance ultimately proved to be the rebels' undoing. Despite their frenzied attacks nearly breaking through, by morning they were forced to retreat. The war would go on for another two years, but it seems that the tide had finally begun to turn. The ambush of the Vulcan marshes was the last major set-piece battle of the Great Illyrian Revolt and from here on, Tiberius and his forces had virtually free reign to complete their stranglehold of the region. The Romans now split themselves into smaller detachments and methodically advanced, burning everything in their path, murdering and enslaving any who tried to resist. In late 7 AD, Severus limped his army north to join with Tiberius, bringing the total number of legions to 10 with a huge number of auxiliary cohorts. While this made the force virtually unbeatable in combat, it imposed a huge logistical burden on the supply lines which Tiberius was not keen on sustaining. He therefore decided to downsize the operations for the remainder of the campaign. This involved dismissing a large number of auxiliary cohorts and actually escorting the Moesian legions out of the combat zone lest they be ambushed once again. Though the rebellion raged on, its embers would be decisively stamped out by 9 AD. We'll have to cover the rest of this campaign in further detail in another video. But for now, we will focus in on one particular area of interest. It is during this time that the Germanic cavalry commander Arminius would have undoubtedly heard from other officers and soldiers of the near disaster in the Vulcan marshes. Five legions ambushed along the road and trapped by swamps? It was an amazing plan, and one which had come so close to working. The Romans had only escaped by the skin of their teeth thanks to the fact that they possessed the high ground and had been able to build a defensive camp. But what if the same scenario could be repeated without these advantages? Or what if the same scenario could be repeated, such that the advantages were held by the attacker? These dark thoughts were seated within the mind of Arminius, who now rode back to Germania. The future traitor had much to think on. Ultimately, the ambush of the Vulcan marshes was very nearly an immediate disaster for the Romans, but its long-term implications were by far the more dangerous. Two short years later, it inspired Arminius to conduct his own carefully planned ambush in the Tudorburg forest. It had been engineered specifically to strip the legions of all their advantages. Here, in the forests of the north, the Germans would perfect what the Illyrians had pioneered. As history would show, the results were devastating. So what do you guys think? How would history have changed had the Romans lost at the Battle of the Vulcan Marshes? Would the Empire have been able to recover if the Illyrians marched on Rome? And why do you think Arminius was so inspired by this event? Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. A big thank you to all the patrons for funding the channel, and to those who made this video possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. See you in the next one.